Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Cray Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Cara St. Louis returns to the show. Cara is beginning her deep dive into the benefits of cannabis. With this conversation, she shares her insights into what she has uncovered thus far with her research. We also discuss the state of the alternative research and truth communities as personalities come and go and shake out. And so without further ado, here's a discussion with Cara. Kara, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's uh, been a little while. I, I have been, you and I spoke before the show started, you know, just kind of bogged down with trying to get that CD out. And so finally, it is out and it's going to be released worldwide, <laughs> whatever that means these days for an independent <laughs> artist, February 27th. So I'll oh, have a link fantastic. down below, folks, for uh, you to take a look and see if you're interested in taking a listen. But we're going to talk about cannabis today. That's going to be the uh, the primary focus. And I know that you're really just getting into this research. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're going to use that as a starting point. And it's going to be a very interesting conversation because as you and I both know, Kara, cannabis and hemp uh, have been around a very long time. It's extremely beneficial to humanity, but uh, quote unquote illegal. And where it's not illegal, it's uh, heavily regulated. And so it's, uh, you know, tucked in under, again, the state apparatus, but we'll get into that. But before we get started, what I wanted to do, like in the news, like as you and I speak right now, is this whole uh, shooting down in Florida. And I was mentioning before we got started that it's very disconcerting to me and alarming because it's a script. It's an obvious script. It's a template. It's the same situation played over and over and over again. The whole process that they go through, you know, lone, craze, young man, he's got all these guns, shoots up the school. The media has all of this choppy footage. And today with everybody having phones that take video with incredible clarity, we're watching something as if it's being filmed through wax paper, you know? So my point being, folks, <laughs> is that it's a script, it's a template, and what's scary about it is, is that the average person out there, the vast majority of the folks believe this stuff, even though they're watching it over and over and over again. And the example I used with Kara before we, we started the show was, it's like somebody watching the same episode of a television show and watching it 20 times. And each time they believe they're watching a different episode. I have friends and family that they talk about it. I try not to talk about it because it's only going to wind up being a, a total argument and ballroom brawl because I'm going to say something that's going to cut right across their grain. But it's right. incredible to me that they just buy into this stuff, hook, line, and sinker. And it's very alarming because, you know, that's how the, uh, the controllers are able to push their agenda because people just roll over. Thank so you. I know that you and I said that we both haven't spent an enormous amount of time focused on this because it's more of the same, but I just wanted to get your input to talk mm -hmm. about this. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm always going to have an opinion on this, Mike. I am because I was raised in the Western United States in the mid 20th century, and I come from a ranching family. Okay. My uncles, my great uncles, my brother, everybody spent their life on the back of a horse. They all had guns. Nobody ever got shot. Okay. There's, what is it, like 17% or something of Americans own firearms. That 17% is you are never going to see irresponsible gun handling from. They are those people that I grew up with. Right. They have them for a reason. They have them for a reason. Um, there's a certain, certain, because that's what this is about, okay? They are desperately trying to push to get rid of our Second Amendment rights. It's the Second Amendment that stands between us and the New World Order and Agenda 21 and the whole world knows, I mean, in terms of the controllers, the controlling world knows it. And a certain percentage of, of people who are a bit more awake in, in the world also know it, okay? What I find the most fascinating about this is that I still don't think that they are ever going to get rid of the Second Amendment. I don't think this is working along those lines. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, I don't know if it's, I guess it's probably okay for me to mention the name of a movie that I saw not too long ago, yeah? 
Well, it was called Hostiles with Christian Bale. I do recommend this movie, by the way. I'm not a big Western fan, but it's, it is a Western, but it's not the kind of Western that we used to pump out in the United States. Um, if I could characterize this movie, it was about the, all of the conflicting feelings and agendas and, uh, um, baggage and loose ends of the, the end of the 19th century in the Western United States. Okay. Where you have Native American populations and you have, you have people coming out of, uh, the Civil War as, as professional soldiers who were assigned to these posts, these, posts in the West. I mean, this is, this is the world I grew up in. I mean, it's not that far behind me, us. It's not far, that far behind us. Okay. Anyway, it was interesting because I was at the movie and I was so filled with, um, I don't know, it was an extraordinarily satisfying experience because it was so illustrative of this, exactly this uh, situation that we're talking about right now. And I know I turned to my husband, who who is German and loved the movie as well, and I said to him, "These are the people. Do they really think that these people are going to give up their guns? These yeah. people are going to blow off the Second Amendment? Nope, not a chance. It'll never happen. It will absolutely never happen. What we need to realize, even when these things are for real, and mostly they're not. Okay, they're not for real." Just because you see it on TV does not mean it's real, gang. We are so brainwashed into that one. Well, I haven't seen it on TV. How could it possibly be real? Oh, my God. Yep. Anyway, mm -hmm. even if it were, the problem is not guns. The problem is antidepressants. Problems, drugs. The problems, drugs. If there were, if there were, and I'm not saying there was, because I just, you know, you just have to err on the side of that just is a show. That's theater. More theater to try to get us to turn in our guns, okay? But if something like that did happen, I would never go to, I would never think about the gun. Never, 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 never. I would be thinking about kind of, what kind of antidepressants was this kid on? What kind That's of drugs was this kid on? Yep. They never That's question. What, they never question why the kid was thinking the way he was. Exactly. It, right. Oh right. my gosh! And and, and th this is the problem. This is what's so evil. And and this is you, you know this is what's causing children to lose and adults. Excuse me. It's what's causing human beings to absolutely lose their sanity. Is that prescriptions that they're handing us to make us feel better? Yeah. But you know they make us psychotic if you go off of them. You know suddenly. You can, it's easily, easily, you're easily put in a suicidal, in suicidal ideation. Okay. This is the problem, gang. The problem is the drugs. Problems is the prescribed antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti this, anti anxiety, all that stuff. That's the problem. Those medications remap the brain neurologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what people need to understand. And I know folks that are on these drugs antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications. And you know what happens, Kara, if they, for some reason, don't get their prescription or they're a little late getting a refill, yes, uh, they have brain zaps. Mm -hmm. They become mm -hmm. almost associative yes. and feeling like they're out there floating and they will describe actual like zapping within, within the head. And what's happening is, is you're no longer... You no longer have that chemical in, in your body anymore. Mm -hmm. And your body has been accustomed to having that chemical in the body and operating that way. And so when it's not there, it's going to misfire. And it's mm -hmm. interesting, as soon as they get their prescription refilled, what happens is those brain zaps go away. It's very wicked. It's, it's really so evil. It really is so, so evil. It is. It is. So I never think gun because I know too many responsible gun owners. Right. I always think, I always think big pharma. Me. But we never go to Big Pharma. Yeah, pff, I can shoot a, hey, I can shoot. I can shoot. Yeah. I grew up in the West with all these people I just described. I'm a really good shot. But so what? You know what I mean? Right. That just means, that just means it's a, it's a skill I have. That's all. It's just a skill. Yeah. Um, but what, okay. I will say that there is going to be, I just read there's going to be a walkout in some of the schools in Colorado to protest school violence. Guess what day that's gonna happen on, Mike? What day? 420, 420. 
420? In Colorado. That's the day we celebrate what? Isn't that the pot celebrate that marijuana celebration day in the United States? I think States? it is. I think it is. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> in Colorado, second state apparently to, I think it's, okay, see, I'm getting schooled on a lot of this stuff. I just did an interview of my own with Vinnie Eastwood and Terry Joyce on this. So I'm learning fast. I'm learning fast and furious right now. And, and I, and I'm, str I'm striving to get to a point where I can, like, I can talk to Mike maybe even again in a while and say, here's the update. Mike, did you, have you delved? What do you think? And it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that will be a nice conversation because right now I feel like this is, it, it, when you get to, when you get to something that is bottom line, when you get a handful, like a scant handful of things that are so crucial, you have to stay there. And you, this is where you stay. And this is where you try to, you try to get the, you try to get the word out. You try to get people to listen to you. I want everybody to know that because I'm talking about cannabis, I'm not talking about the best way to party, guys. Has nothing to, I mean, kind of, but just as a start, as a start in terms of describing to you and to Mike how I, came to give a darn about this, about this. So this is, this turns out to be, and you're also talking about antidepressants and anti-anxieties. Guess what the best medicine in the world is for that, aside from not being anxious and not having, having events that make you feel that way, which really is about the modern world, the world mm -hmm. we live in. Okay. The best way you can find your way back to health with those kinds of conditions is through cannabis. Yep. Yeah. And Big Pharma knows that, babes. They yep. know it. They know it. But there's no money in health. There's no money in birth. There's no money in death. There's no money in health. There's only money in disease. Yeah, well, okay. they, they've made it illegal to grow a plant. Think about that. Think yeah, about that. On, you cannot grow on. a plant. You mm -hmm. know, so I mean, if they found that azalea bushes were good for us in some way, they would say you cannot have an azalea bush, you know. They would. They yeah, would. No, they absolutely would. And so that that's, the, you know, when you start to kind of dig down at that level, you just think very basically, I can't grow a plant. I can't have a plant. And they don't want people to be able to then um, to become proficient in being able to extract from that plant what they mm -hmm. need in order to help them health wise. Like mm -hmm. such, right? Right, right. And if you're a Bible person, uh, then you may know that it's one of the two sacred plants listed in the Bible. Whoever wrote the Bible, they listed cannabis as one of the sacred herbs. Anyway, so let me tell you, Mike, how, Mike and I have talked so many times over the years that he'll help me like steer me through this because I do tend to go off on tangents. But I do want to talk about how I first came to care about this, okay? Uh, when I was a kid growing up in New Mexico in the 60s and 70s, Everybody, as I said to Mike, had a trunk full of stuff that had brought, been brought over the border from Mexico. There was no wall. There was no, I mean, it was, it was very porous back then, this border between Mexico and the USA. And that's just what it was. It's extraordinarily normal in New Mexico, probably Arizona too. I don't know. Anyway, and, but by the time I was about 15, I just wasn't interested in smoking anymore. So I didn't which was neither here nor there. It was just a, like a decision. It, it just got bored me. But then I had children of my own. I had children of my own. And um, as they got to be teenagers, especially my oldest son, I was starting to see children die. And in this little area of Maine, there was a big old, there was really kind of an epidemic for several years. It was a very depressed part of the country. There's not a lot of jobs in Maine. It's mostly woods still. You know, and most people are kind of happy to have it be that way because it stays unpopulated and stays uh, pristine to a certain extent. But it means there's no jobs and there's no money and, and there's just a lot of depression amongst the children who don't know what to do with themselves, can't get out, whatever. And, um, and maybe come from a family of generations of that, I don't know. But alcohol was always in, was involved in a lot of deaths for a long time. People were driving their cars into trees at hundreds of miles, you know, a hundred miles an hour and, or accidentally, you know, accidentally killing themselves behind the wheel because they're, because alcohol was involved. So, um, that being the case, I happen to think that I, we, we really all need to kind of re-examine our relationship with alcohol period anyway, 
because I promise you the people I know who are in the know in the sort of Illuminati circles say, hands down, that's what they use to mess us up. Alcohol. That's right. You know, they keep it. that's right. It's just a fact, you guys. It's just a fact. Okay. So, so there's that. What that means to me, though, is that children who are smoking a joint, like if you have six or eight or 10 kids in your living room, high school kids, and they're smoking a joint, they're a hell of a lot safer. They're safe. They're not out behind the wheel with a half a, a bottle of Jack under their belts, you know, or a dozen beers or whatever, having lost their all ability to reason. OK, so as a parent, as a human being, as somebody who loves children, period, I have to say that the only logical stance to take is pro cannabis. It's the only now. Now I'm going to introduce some provisos, though. It really needs to be the real thing. Now we're running into a problem with this. OK, we're running into a big problem with this because. Because there is synthetic everything out there right now. There's GMO. There's some. Let me start at the beginning here. Historically, let's just talk about how cannabis became to be outlawed to begin with. It isn't just William Randolph Hearst, although that was a big part of it, right? That whole he had logging interests, man, and he had newspapers. That was like his the two things he had that was going to keep him in the money. And so he was instrumental in launching this campaign against cannabis that ended up being, um, what was the name of that movie? Reefer Madness, right? That was, it was, that ended up in the end. He was, he had help. I'm going to tell you who he had help from. He had help from DuPont. He had help from DuPont because DuPont had invented nylon and hemp makes the best rope bar none on this planet. It, you know, for all kinds of reasons, stronger, dries out, you know, it, it lasts forever. There was a period of time in this, in this country, maybe in other countries too, I would think in England as well, since they are such a seafaring nation. But when it was illegal not to grow hemp, if you had a, if you had a farm, a certain percentage of that had to be plowed in hemp or in cannabis, which becomes hemp through a yeah. process. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's also the cotton farmers. Material made from hemp uses a hell of a lot less water and energy than cotton. Okay. So the cotton farmers weren't exactly excited about hemp either. And then, as always, you have to introduce into any situation where there's money to be made the Rockefeller family. Mr. Rockefeller, the original Rockefeller, I look at that guy and I think, what planet did you come from, man? Because he so does not look human. Does he look human to you? No. And, and the thing is, you know, they are really the foundation behind all of the medical, the American. That's it. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There came a time, there came a time when they, when they set up all the medical schools and yeah. they set up regulations amongst all the state governments to license doctors. So in essence, when someone goes in to get their license to practice medicine, they're not really getting it from the state. They're getting it from the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers are giving them the right to practice medicine. They're giving all their money to the medical schools who do it the way they want it done. And the way they want it done is to make sure that we're good and sick all the time. There are other things biologically that go along with, with cannabis, okay? And those have to do with the endocannabinoid system, which is something I'm just learning about. I'm just learning about it, but I promise you, I'll bet you a paycheck that the Rockefellers already knew, knew about it a hundred years ago or more. The endocannabinoid system is starting to look more and more like it's absolutely foundationally responsible for homeostasis in human beings. We used to get this. It used to be part of the pharmacology. I mean, to what, like 1930, 1935, it was, it was prescribed by physicians. But we also used to get it, we would get it into our bodies because animals were free ranging on this stuff. Okay. Cows, chickens. I mean, we would get it through meat, any kind of game. They, animals were free ranging on cannabis because this planet was covered with cannabis. Okay. It is also bar none, the single most effective remediator of soil because it is truly a partner to this planet 
is absolutely part of the health of the planet. So when you talk about the war on Terra, T-E-R-R-A, I can't claim that. I heard Pepe Escobar, or no, I saw Pepe Escobar write that the other day. Yes, I thought, oh, <laughs> I love that. I love that so exactly what it is, the war on Terra, and ripping all the, ripping cannabis out of the soil and making it so that we can't put it back in the soil or we risk going to prison was a serious blow to us and to this planet. Oh, and also you can't forget Nixon. You cannot forget the war on drugs. The war on drugs, when he really got that ramped up, he also simultaneously discovered that it cured, they had discovered that it cured cancer. And folklore is that he was livid, absolutely livid about that because he'd just gotten this very lucrative war on, on drugs um, ramped up. And, and, and if there was some evidence that cannabis cured cancer, that would kind of ruin that. So, yeah. OK, so look at all the people who helped make cannabis illegal by the one. It's still ske a schedule one class one drug, schedule one drug right up there with heroin. It's because we exist in a system of commerce. That's why everything is always, always about the economy, a good economy, a healthy economy, a robust economy. They keep talking about that all the time. That is to benefit the kingpins that mm -hmm. control the economy. Mm -hmm. So, so anything that is going to be or could possibly be introduced into the equation and affect their ability to make their money and their profits and all that stuff, it's just not going to come to the surface because I mean, it's not even just the cannabis, right? Look at mm -hmm. what they did to Nikola Tesla, uh, mm -hmm. Rife. You know, these are all people Rice, yeah. table, right? With uh, all yeah. kinds of uh, ideas and proven. Yeah, ideas about how things could be better, and they just got stopped. I mean, the case of Tesla was J.P. Morgan, right? Pulled the plug on them. So this is what we see all yeah. the time. It's it's to one, it's to ensure that whatever is in play benefits them economically, money wise. Right. right. And most of the time, those things are not good for us. They're unhealthy right. for us. Right. You mentioned the alcohol before when you were talking about, I was thinking about yeah. when I was younger, right? Mm -hmm. So you'd smoke some weed and, you know, you just kind of mellowed out. But when you drank alcohol, what happens to a lot of people when they drink alcohol is aggression surfaces. Right? Yeah. I'm not talking, not even aggression from the standpoint of fighting or tangling it up. Although I did see that plenty of times growing up as, right. you know, as a guy, right? Right. Uh, also, aggression, just doing stupid shit. That, yes. Right. Right. That you your boundaries come down. Yeah. 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 You have your judgment. It just flies out the window. And then it's all you know dependency and and you know mm -hmm. alcohol abuse and everything else uh, later on mm -hmm. for people who really just cannot get away from it. So yeah, I just right. wanted to make that point because um, they want to keep poking at things like weed and and, and hemp and cannabis, but. They won't do anything about alcohol. In fact, they openly right. market and push alcohol. Go watch a football mm -hmm. game or mm -hmm. a baseball game, right? Right. Because right. They, they drink responsibly. That they've done their, <laughs> okay. their yeah, good okay. deed, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So you could put the same thing on, a, on the side of a package of cannabis. Yeah. Please smoke responsibly. Smoke responsibly. At the point, Look, I say so. So here we are, though, Mike. The the more in, the most interesting things that I found out in the last few days. First of all, I want to tell you, just so you know, because these are these are representative of what the, the insanity that's still out there around cannabis, even in legal states. Okay. Now I talked to Benny Eastwood. It's not legal in New Zealand, but he's a big uh, campaigner for making it legal down there. Yeah. quite brave of him and the reason he became a campaigner is because i don't know what he said six seven eight years ago he was arrested because he was he had it on him and he'd been dealing it and and this kind of thing and i want to say this story because i want you to hear this story out there folks i hear this story the cops who arrested him in new zealand said eh Vinny, just tell us everything just come you know 
come on, confide in us. It'll be okay. We'll go easy. We always go easy on the people who just, you know, tell us what's up. Give us the real thing. You know, come clean. Well, guess what? Big mistake. I would say a big, it's always a big mistake. Okay. Five minutes later, he said he was looking at like an eight year sentence or mm -hmm. something. I don't know how that, I, I think it probably just, he says, now I have complex PTSD for the rest of my life because I was so terrorized by that incident, you know, and uh, I don't, I probably cost him a whole lot of money to resolve that. Absolutely. You know? And then, but I want people to hear that. I want people to hear that because I'll, I mean, I can't even think how many thousands of times a day that happens to somebody. The other thing was Terry Joyce got into it when she went into a medical dispensary in LA and all of a sudden she was looking down the barrel of a gun because the DEA raided the place because you've got a fight going on, which is probably largely for show now. But for a while, the DEA and the states, you know, they were duking it out over this because the states were given the right to decide whether or not it was legal. Well, after prohibition, the DEA had nothing to do. Yeah. They needed a new a new villain. OK, I forgot to even mention the DEA was a big part of villainization. But so. She said, all of a sudden, I'm in a state where it's legal and I'm standing in a medical dispensary and I've, I'm looking down the barrel of a gun. This is the insanity. This is the schizophrenia that's still going going along with this so-called legalization. Now, one of the things that I've learned lately, because remember, Mike, I, we were all saying when when legalization was coming down the pike, yeah, that's going to last about five minutes until Monsanto gets a hold of it or, you know, what's actually going on here? We were kind of all very suspicious about this, right? Right, that's right. So it turns out that, I don't know, before California and Colorado had legalization. So that was what, 93, 94, something like that? Was it that long ago? Was it the mid 90s? Maybe it wasn't even that long ago, but it hasn't been that long ago anyway. Yeah. Go figure, Monsanto funded a big old uh, focus group using the entire country of Uruguay and trying to figure out, they, they, they legalized it in Uruguay for both, for both purposes, which by the way, I don't think it should be called medical marijuana because you know, if you study the endocannabinoid system at all, you realize it's a nutrient. And if we had the nutrient, we wouldn't be getting sick. So it's all nutrient. Okay. Yeah, if you specify, yeah, yeah. If you specify recreational and medical, then you really keep it in a drug class, right? And you also give people, you also put it in people's brains that they have the right to regulate it as a medicine, right? Because it could be dangerous. Yeah, right? it has the word medical in front of it, so anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to start calling it a nutrient, honestly. Yeah. But however, so Monsanto developed GMO pot in Uruguay. All right, they developed G GMO pot in Uruguay. And guess who was who actually funded that big old thing? That big old experiment was funded by George Soros. Okay. Okay. There That's we surprise. go. <laughs> There's a shock for you, right? <laughs> Anyways, you got Monsanto and you got George Soros and you got Uruguay. So then California apparently was the first state to legalize it, which I actually didn't realize because I'm medical marijuana. I didn't realize it because Colorado got so much attention. When yeah, they, it did, Colorado did seem to get a lot of attention with it. They did. They got a lot of attention. It wasn't very long after they legalized it that the biggest. And I want to check my notes because I want to say this right. I want to. I make sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, here we go, baby. Here we go. Not very long after it was legalized mm -hmm. in Colorado, the largest grower of marijuana in Colorado was General Hydroponics, which is out of Santa Rosa, by the way, was bought, purchased by Scott's Miracle Grow, purchased by Roundup, folks, which is owned by Monsanto. Yeah. There is an estimate now that 90% of the pot you buy or ingest or whatever use, utilized in Colorado is GMO. 90%. They yeah. got it in there. They got yeah. it. We had no idea. We had no idea, right? Well, this is the thing, right? So they play They play everybody. They play the entire population. And so people who have it legalized in these states, they think it's a win-win. They, they're thinking they're in a progressive state. You know, they're mm -hmm. ahead of the, the curve and all that stuff. 
But in reality, they're not ahead of anything. This is all laid out. Mm -hmm. This is all yeah. strategized and it's all planned. It's to make people have that mindset that they're actually winning. We're winning because, you know, we have this now, it's legal. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you're not winning anything. They're, they're, what they're doing is they're, they're allowing this to be introduced now. They're allowing this to happen. And mm -hmm. as they allow it to happen, Kara, they're going to do exactly what you just laid out. They're going to own it. That's the thing. <laughs> That's, That's it. The they're going to own it. Okay. Yeah. You can't That's own the it. Thing. They're going to own it. Yeah, you know, those of us who are sort of, uh, you know, us elder statesmen have, that are around this, this alternative community, we're going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. Hmm. Right. Interesting. But you know what? I mean, we, we got to talk about that in the end. We have to talk about what our attitude, what, what our plan is, what our attitude, what goes, what's forward now. Right. Yep. But I also want to say that in January, oh, you know what, before I go even one millisecond further, I want to say, because I'm a stickler for this, I'm getting the best research right now, and I'm gonna say it, because I told her I was going to, because I said, look, I'm getting on shows right now, and I'm talking about this, and I wanna make sure everybody understands, Danny Arnold McKinney of Transpicuous News is the one who's, to my knowledge, okay, there's probably others, but this is where I'm getting the best research right now. Absolutely the best research. Check out her channel. She's got, you know, she will lead you into this particular topic. I want to make sure, because as Mike knows, there's nothing that irritates me more than people come, who come on and start spouting stuff like they invented it. The reality is we use each other's research. Okay, right, now. That's right. That's it. We use Send each other's research. Her, and I'll make sure I'm going to the description box. I'm going to, absolutely, I'm going okay. to. Now, what she said, there was in, in late January of this year, Colorado, uh, 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 an initiative went to the Colorado legislature, okay? The development of marijuana tracking technology got to be developed if it passes at Colorado State University. That's in Fort Collins. I know that one well. It must include an agent to be applied to the marijuana plant. Okay. What's an agent? Or hemp. An agent, right? So what is that? Like, uh, 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 right. is this Roundup? Is this like a spray? Yeah. You know? what, what is okay. it? Right? Uh, anyway, must be applied to marijuana plants, hemp, or industrial hemp products. All right. This agent must be scannable to indicate whether the product was sold by someone who was registered or licensed. Yeah, okay, they want to keep track of the the licenses that they're selling, and they want to tax, make sure it tax, gets taxed, blah, 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 blah. But there's a whole lot more to it than that. Anytime you're spraying something on a plant like this, which is profoundly medicinal, you know, or nutritional, you have a problem, especially in the world that we live in, which is glyphosate-covered. Yep. Okay. Everything's covered in glyphosate now. Yep. You know, so so this is a problem. This is a problem. Okay, the Department of Agriculture will oversee this program. It will be the the agent, ready? The agent will be made available through law enforcement or the Department of Revenue. So you got to go to your what? Local cop shop to get this stuff that you spray on your plant or what? Or oh, probably some you know? permit to yeah. be able to purchase it. So yeah. you go someplace, if you have to purchase the agent, you're going to need some kind of official documentation that says that you're allowed to purchase it. Mm -hmm. So it's just amazing. It really is, you know, versus folks being able to grow a plant in your backyard, doing your own thing. Everything is regulated, right? In a system of commerce, you have to have licenses, you have to register, you have to be inspected, you have to go through all of these things. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's a stifling stuff stifling yeah. bureaucracy and it's it's done intentionally absolutely and and the products that you get through the dispensaries then come from the pharmacy from the pharma you know big pharma oh yeah you know so what the hell are you getting you're not you know okay so this is how they've captured and we knew they were going to do it we knew they were going to do it it was inevitable they were going to capture this process however what we need to do now is learn about the endocannabinoid system. We need to understand how it is that it helps us. Most of our endocannabinoid, every cell, there is, there is a school of thought, which is a body of knowledge. It's like, it's biology. It's, 
it's medicine that states that every cell in your body has an endo has a cannabinoid receptor. Every cell in your body has one. The biggest congregations of them are in your brain and your gut, your other mm -hmm. brain. Okay. They communicate with each other all the time. And then of course they're all through your body. Now, what people are finding who are able to um, prescribe these uh, CBD oil and, and extracts from cannabis and things like that and watch individuals over time to see how they react or watch themselves, however it is that it works for them, is that the endocannabinoid system is restored just like that. Very easy to restore the endocannabinoid system as long as you're getting these things introduced to your system. Now. There is there is lots and lots of evidence that it provides for our homeostasis. We become a lot less disrupted. There's a balance. Yes. Right? Yes. And we become a lot less sheep like. We become a lot harder to mind control. Oh, forget that, Cara. <laughs> I know, right? We do. We become a whole lot harder to mind control. I mean, based on what Mike and I have just said in the last 45 minutes, of course they made it illegal for God's sake. They want to control us, and it, it, it is freedom. It is health. It is sustainability. Now, you want to talk about sustainability? That's the agenda. That should be the agenda right there. Now, let's talk about understanding medical cannabis, cannabinoids, and their therapeutic effects. I gave him a bunch of graphics that he can use or not use. Some of them, whatever he feels like is most important, but... There are three kinds of cannabis. There's raw, there's heated, and there's aged. I don't know anything about aged. I will find out. Heated is when you get the extracts, right? And raw, well, you know, this is what the animals should be eating, that we should be getting secondhand through our food. But there are actually, let me count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 kinds of extracts that come from cannabis. It's not just CBD. It's not just THC. However, what I did learn today and yesterday was that no matter what kind you take, it has to have, it must have the smallest amount of THC in it to activate your cannabinoid receptors. I intend to make myself an expert on the endocannabinoid system as it comes around. So there are people talking about and, and experimenting with because they're licensed to be able to do this. Okay. They're not, you know, what kinds of oils in what dimensions, you know, um, there's somebody said a 50, 50 kind of thing with, uh, sati you know, there's a difference between sativa and what's the other one might, right. I did say I'm learning about this, but there's, uh, there's two different kinds. One start, I think one starts with an A anyway. Get a 50-50 mix and you've got somebody with, uh, people with um, autoimmune diseases. Yeah. People, people with, uh, that can't move, you know, th their bodies are just constantly in this state of trying to um, get rid of all the crap that's gone oh, into their body. Right. That's, right. that's what the auto autoimmune diseases are. You give them a 50-50 between the two different kinds and you've got somebody who can live again. You've got somebody who may even be completely pain free. Okay. What I've noticed with this chart is that virtually all of these, um, I guess these different, I guess the therapeutic effects or these cannabinoids, almost all of them are anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Which is yes. an eye opener because a lot of these autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis yeah. and, and lupus, whatnot, yeah, yeah, all about all that stuff, right? Yeah. And the two kinds, by the way, are sativa and indica. Okay. All right. Those are the two kinds. Indica tends to be more toward pain relief, appetite stimulator. Sativa tends to be more toward increased energy. It's best for daytime use, that kind of thing. Okay. But the different mixes of these plants and the oils and the extracts from these plants are having tremendous effects on people's illnesses. Absolutely tremendous. Now, and, and, and I'm, I've got these uh, graphics up right in front of me. I want to I want to go through two of them real quick. No, three of them real quick with Mike. The first one is the, the general one that I gave you that just says cannabis, Mike. Yeah. This is if you have any knowledge of cannabis, you're going to know this stuff anyway. But I'm just going to say that the proven effects are it stops can't proven effects are that it stops cancer growth. It reduces neurological impairment. 
relaxes muscles and is an antispasmodic, prevents migraines, treats glaucoma, treats ADD, ADHD, reduces IBS. Is that inflammatory bowel syndrome? I guess it is. Crohn's yes. disease. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Cures epilepsy, prevents Alzheimer's, treats PMS. It's an antipsychotic. It makes biodegradable plastic. It makes paper. It makes fuel, solvents, lubricants. It makes industrial textiles. It makes building materials, could end deforestation, could end dependence on oil, gas, and coal, and can be grown almost anywhere. Right. What a rotten plant. Anyway, um, also I have, I have a graphic that is the difference between cannabis and oxycodone, which is what they, this is what they've, they're throwing at you when they could be giving you cannabis, right? Right. And there's this opioid uh, epidemic in the United States. Yeah. Yes. That's that, you know, your children are dying. There are maybe three, four, five syndromes or states of affairs that have been created by these these uh, monsters who need want nothing more than to disem disembowel us, disempower us, and control us, that are causing our children to drop like flies. Do they never talk children. about the opioid problem in in this country, which is completely out of control? They never Absolutely. never talk about it, and that's because right. they hand that stuff out like it's has like it's candy. Hell yeah. yes. Yep, and so they don't want to uh, let the cat out of the bag and say, yeah, we prescribe this stuff 24-7, 365 days a year to yeah. you know, yeah. millions and yeah. millions of people. There's all kinds of problems with addiction. It's unbelievable. Right. Here in, in yeah. Raleigh, uh, I was talking to a few folks, and they said uh, heroin is a huge problem here. It's, it's, it's bigger than the um, painkiller uh, yeah, drug problem, but still – Either one is, is not a good thing. No. So I'm just going to briefly kind of go down the differences. Uh, they've yep. got cannabis and oxycodone or hydrocodone lined up against each other. I've never been able to take oxycodone. I've had surgeries before. It's been given to me. It makes me feel like I'm going to stop breathing because it's a respiratory depressant. It, it depresses your respiratory system. Cannabis doesn't. All right, so listen, it's, cannabis is illegal. It's a Schedule One drug, which means no doctor can legally prescribe it. All possessors are criminals. Only 16 states, only 16 states won't prosecute medicinal users. Actually, I thought that was eight, but let's let's pretend it's 16. That's great. Um, I'm assuming North Carolina isn't one of them, though. No. North no. Carolina, we're, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. North Carolina okay. is still back around, you know, 1925. <laughs> okay. Oxycodone, legal, legal, Schedule II drug. All doctors can prescribe it. Possessors with prescriptions face no discrimination, and um, but it's illegal to possess otherwise. You need a prescription. Okay. Um, now, potential for abuse is the next bit here. High potential for abuse, supposedly, this is cannabis. About 9% of those who try it become dependent. Yeah, you know what? I would quibble with that, Mike. I would quibble with that, but I'll leave it. says NIDA, National Institute of Drug. Oh, well, yeah. What, what was the statistic? Nine eh, percent. I don't believe it. NIDA is the National Institute of Drugs and Alcohol, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't believe anything they say. So they say nine percent anyway. become addicted. Yes, dependent. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. Withdrawal is mild and includes irritability and sleeplessness. I'm sure that there is some psychological dependency on because there's psychological dependency on anything. We we we've found that out. Anyway, the psychological the dependency on people who, you know, who, who eat certain foods, they think certain. Yeah. Foods yeah. You can eat more. Cheetos and be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyway. Cheetos make me happy, you know, and so I'm going to eat yes. Cheetos because they make me happy. Yes. <laughs> High potential for abuse and oxycodone. Abuse has risen 300 percent in 12 years. Withdrawal includes craving, nausea, cold sweats, diarrhea, pain and depression. Risen 300 percent in 12 years. Going. OK, now. This says there's no medicinal value despite 5,000. This is what the NIDA says. It's nonsense. Okay. Despite 5,000 years, 5,000 years of medicinal use, 16 medical marijuana states and four remaining federal marijuana and four remaining federal medical marijuana patients. I don't even know what the rest of that means. 5,000 years of medicinal use, gang, no medicinal value, that's a lie. That is the biggest, one of the biggest lies you've ever been told. 
That's one of the biggest lies you've ever been told. Cannabis is your best friend if it's treated as a nutrient, okay? Additionally, it's curing cancer and several other maladies, morbidities that we discussed. It, is, it just is. The data is there, man. All right, the medicinal values of oxycodone, despite common side effects like constipation, dizziness, drowsiness, dry mouth, headache, Headache, nausea, sweating, vomiting, plus potential of overdose death. Those are minor. Just skip over that. Minor. Hey, man, <laughs> I can't take it because it makes me feel like I'm going to stop breathing. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather know, I'd rather feel, you know. Well, if you stop the breathing, then whatever it is that you're sick from, it goes away. Okay. So you That's right. Solved. You're well cured. <laughs> okay. The NIDA says that it can't be used safely under a doctor's care. That's cannabis. Yeah. The NIDA says oxycodone can be used safely under a doctor's care. All right. The fact of the matter is cannabis has killed nobody in 5,000 years, according to this graphic. Oxycodone has killed 14,800 people in 2008 alone. So I'm going to guess that this graphic's from 2008. Those statistics are verifiable. And it's probably a lot more than that. But they put down numbers they have to put down, right? Yeah. Can't get away, can't get out of saying this. Since 1996, the government has tried to eliminate cannabis in states that approve it as a medicine. See, this is the feds versus the state right there. Since 1996, the government has approved oxycodone by a 1,200% production increase. This is insanity, gang. Since 1996, the makers of cannabis contribute zero to federal politicians. Well, that's why they're protecting the, the opium fields in Afghanistan. Exactly. Since 1996, the makers of oxycodone have contributed $147 million to federal politicians. Okay. Now, the, other, the third one, was there a third one I wanted to go through with? Yes, there is. Let me grab this one because this is super important. Guess who owns the patent on cannabis? I'm going to guess it's either the U.S. government or it's, a, it's a, a corporation. One would have thought Monsanto, but guess what? It's the U.S. government. There you go. There you go. U.S. patent number 6,633,507. They have the patent on cannabinoids. Yeah. Cannabinoids are useful in the treatment of, this is what they say in their patent. Cat and cannabinoids are useful in the treatment and prophylaxis of wide variety of oxidation associated diseases, such as ischemic, ischemic age related inflammatory, and autoimmune diseases. There is such an epidemic of all of the above. Yeah. The cannabinoids are found to have particular application as neuroprotectants. For example, in limiting neurological damage following ischemic insults such as stroke and trauma, or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and HIV dementia. I would think any dementia. Okay, it's this is what it says right in the U.S. patent, right in the U.S. patent. This is what it says, guys. Okay. And the U.S. government can have a patent because the U.S. government is a corporation. That's right. They can. Absolutely. They're a corporation. And, um, you know, if, if people, you know, if folks don't understand that, I did a couple of shows on that a few years back. You can go take a look or listen to some of Jordan Maxwell's material and you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Right, right. So the next thing I want to bring up, because it's just something that we can have a good conversation about around, is the Northern California fires. I was there speaking in December, as I tend to do, because I love that area. It's so beautiful, Mike. It's so beautiful. So I go there in December to talk about whatever I happen to be talking about at, that, at any given time. But this year, I wanted to go because of the fires. So uh, the reality is, and the reality is I wanted to go because of the fires, because this area called the Emerald Triangle burnt to the ground as part of that directed energy weapon assault on Northern California that is foundationally about Agenda 21. That's right. Okay. That's what that's about. We all wanted to get together and talk about that before it faded from people's memories by the next catastrophe, whether that was a hurricane or an earthquake or whatever. Or shooting or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Right. Each area, there are many, many areas in the country 
that have geographical trauma signatures, very much on purpose, and this is UN generated, and this is about Agenda 21. New Orleans, it's about the water. Yeah, it's about the hurricanes, it's about Katrina, it's about every hurricane that comes through there. What is happening is, this is UN sanctioned, I can't even remember, I don't have the data right in front of me anymore, but something ungodly like $70 million was spent by the US government to, uh, in an effort to make that area of the country seem uninhabitable. What they do is they try to chase you off. Well, you're gonna have you're gonna have this climbing up your back door soon in North Carolina. This is a very desirable area to live in. They're gonna chase everybody out of there, just like they do it in Florida. They do it in uh, they did it in New Orleans. Anyway, everybody has a, a geographical trauma signature. For Florida, it's hurricanes. For New Orleans, it's hurricanes. For um, and, yes. I'll say something about that later. Anyway, for California, it's earthquakes and fire. Earthquakes and, and fire. Yeah. And droughts. Earthquakes, yeah. droughts, and fires. The fires supposedly follow the droughts, right? Yeah. Which mm -hmm. anyway, Northern California, this particular area, Santa Rosa, has become one of those places where they're just trying to really push Agenda 21 into place. The stack and pack stuff you know, where they get people in high raises and make it, 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 it's, it's all about chasing them out of the desirable areas, containing them so that they're useful to the powers that be, you yeah. know, we are, we are servants. We are a hive that serves the, the, you know, the elites. But when I found out that the Emerald Tri Triangle had burnt down, I really wanted to go there and talk about it because I thought, you know, that was probably one of the major things that they were after, you know, the Emerald Triangle had just now. Now, we're going to get the Jesuit Jerry Brown into the mix, too. So it becomes a bit cloudy on what was actually going on there. But let's talk. Let's say what. You're talking about their governor, Jerry Moonbeam. Governor Brown. Jerry. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> governor Brown. Yeah. Crazy old Governor Brown. Anyway. Yep, Scotty. Yep. Oh, my God. Anyway, so the the growers in these counties in the Emerald Triangle had just been given by the state of California, by the governor, the right to use what's known as an appellation, just like the vintners in Northern California. They could say that their product was from a certain county. And what that did or what it would have done was elevate their status to an artisanal quality and really, really, I think, take a lot of the bogus, uh, you know, negative, connotation away from what they were growing so they had I mean that was astonishing to me that they had just been given this right to do this and recreational um, uh, uh, legalization of recreational marijuana was due in January anyway they decided to push it forward so I had it was like before December or something like that anyway there was a lot going on in terms of cannabis in Northern California and all of a sudden the Emerald Triangle burns to the ground so that interested me right yeah. mm -hmm. so one of this one of the things i wanted to talk about so while i was giving my lecture there i was lucky enough to have a couple of because california's got a lot of hosts if i went to north california if i went to northern carolina north carolina i would assume mike would be in the audience because he'd know if he wasn't there I'd, he'd be dead i would be there <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> anyway so I had a lot of people. Uh, Emily Moyer was there. I was so fortunate. And this character called Jeff Gates that a lot of us really know. Um, and he, as I was going through my lecture, he said, you know, what's happening now is that there's a big guerrilla movement growing in this country, hopefully worldwide, of people saving seeds. Well, what did I know at that point? I mean, I think we should all be saving seeds. We should be saving seeds since carrots went GMO. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But there's a big gorilla movement for people to save seeds. Why, Jeff? Why are people saving seeds? Because most of it's GMO already. That's why. So I'm telling you out there right now, even if you don't smoke, if you're in a, in a, a state where it's legal and you won't go to prison for having a seed, save seeds. Save seeds, please. Because this is this is this is what I was saying to Mike. We got to talk about what our way forward is. We're going to have to play the game with them of legalization because they've got a game going. 
They've got a game going that we need to be able to use to our advantage, okay? They're saying cannabis should be legal. They're saying it has medicinal value. They're saying it. Right. So let's, let's use that to our advantage. Let's understand that what you're getting, and you know, it just makes my heart break. When I think of people who are going into the dispensaries because they desperately need medical, physical help from this stuff, and what they may be getting, you know, but you have to hope that it helps some, you know. Yeah, that's the thing. That that's what gets called into question is that if if the same if the powers to be the controllers are actually in essence behind manufacturing this, you you do have to legitimately question what am I getting? Yeah. You yeah. know, is it watered down? You know, has it been produced in a way that it's uh, far less impactful? I yep. have to do more of it to get the same yep. result. If you know, all of these questions is these are legitimate questions to ask, Kara. In fact, you know, when all these mm -hmm. states started uh, legalizing it, uh, you know, I wasn't one of these people jumping up and down, going, "Oh, we won, we won." I'm thinking to myself, "What's up with this?" Ninety-five percent of the THC that you can get right now is synthetic. Yeah, that you can get from a dispensary or whatever. I mean, I just have to hope that it's helping people a little bit. I, I assume that it is. I hope that it is. Some people who do know are saying that there are plants that help boost the endocannabinoid system if you're in a state where you can't get any of this stuff. Yeah. Okay. I'll read the list. Okay. Then you have to be oh, be careful that what the, what's on this list that you're getting is authentic as well, which is always, you know. I mean, you have to source this stuff. And it's crazy what you have to do to source this stuff properly to find the good stuff, to find the authentic stuff. Grow it yourself. You know what? There is no bigger re rebellion or anarchy in the whole wide world than growing your own stuff. Okay, take absolute control of what you know, yep. of what's going on. All right. Anyway, boosting your an endocannabinoid system, the stars are echinacea, tuoxicum. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to tell you that because maybe you do. Yep. Milk thistle. A lot of these support the liver too. Burdock, chalidonium, dark chocolate. Seriously dark chocolate. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the one that doesn't yeah. actually taste, you know, like. I got to tell you, I get this cho I get this chocolate that's like 90%, 95%. I know. Bitter, right? <laughs> I, <remember. laughs> I offered a bit to this this woman I used to teach with, this younger woman whom I yeah. love dearly. And so I offered her a bit of chocolate. She put it in her mouth and it just came right back out. She's like, oh, that's what my mom used to bake with. What is that? You know? Yeah, yeah. They're thinking that's they're going to get an M&M, &M, you know, that, that type yeah. of chocolate. Yeah, It's got to be that stuff. And black pepper. Mm-hmm. But remember, a lot of the black pepper you buy is moldy. You got to get peppercorns from like an organic. Yeah. Just, you just do your best. Do your best. I mean, it's it's this constant, constant running to try to stay ahead, an inch ahead, saving your own life when they're trying so hard to kill you. Yeah, really. even like with organic foods, right? So organic, you know, they they can't use. Uh, the pesticides, but organic food, they can grow the organic food in non-organic, using non-organic fertilizer, you mm -hmm. see? So it goes to your point, Kara, that you only do the very best that you can do. Exactly. So there's, there's, there's no roadmap out there. There's, there's, there's no definitive path where somebody's going to put you on and say, walk here and all your questions will be answered. And that's because they've created it that way. They've made it so that it becomes very, very difficult for us to be able to do the research and to land on, is this the best possible solution? Yeah. Mike, how many times in our life have we, have we selected something out and said, ah, oh, this is good. Yeah. This is good. This is why it's good. And then found out it's just another fucking con. Yep. That they just shoved something else in our, in our, yep. with a lot of pretty packaging, uh, uh, write ups that convince us that it's good. And it turns out to be, you know. But I um, also want to say that most of the plants that help, as I said, most of the plants that help the endocannabinoid system work directly with the liver and the kidneys. Okay. okay. All right. Also, just as a sidebar, there's something called Eziac or Eziac tea. 
I don't know what that is yet, but I, I do have someone in my household who might know. I'm going to go grill this somebody. If you have a link to this stuff too, Kara, I'll put this in the description box. Yeah, well, yeah. this is also in this endocannabinoid, two-hour endocannabinoid uh, documentary documentary uh, conversation that's on uh, uh, Danny Arnold McKinney's uh, channel. Okay, with a couple, good. Um, with a couple of women that I'm we'll sure might that. Know. Right, because this is not, like we, we said in the beginning, this is not... We're just yeah. kind of feeling our way through this. Yep. We are feeling our way through this, but we're going to get the word out. We are yep. going to do it. And just as a sidebar, radishes reduce the effects of glycosate. Well, oh, okay. FYI. Okay. Because we're covered. I mean, everything's covered in glycosate now. Yeah. Everything. It's not necessarily like I have a really huge problem with grains. Grains kill in my, in my world. I can't do them. Yeah. I can't do them at all, and part of that is um, part of that is the bastardization of of the grains in the last however many thousands of years. But also part of it is that they're just all covered in glycosate. What I did, you know, talking about grains, I try to limit them in my diet. I don't say I have, I have eliminated them. I try. I have reduced it, and I know friends and family that have taken it out of their diet. But here's an interesting little factoid for the audience: I have two dogs. They're actually my daughter's dogs, but one of them, uh, Charlie, spends most of his time with me, but they uh, were eating at one time, a long time ago, they were eating the um, the pet food, the dry food out of the supermarket. So even though you thought you were buying a good brand, right? Mm -hmm. not, not a knockoff brand. You're, you're thinking you're buying a quality brand in a supermarket. The mm -hmm. dogs are itching. So then what happened was uh, a few years ago, we switched the dogs to grain-free. Mm -hmm. natural dog food with filtered right. water and all that stuff. Guess what? Yeah. All of the scratching stopped. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now are they are they hounds or what kind of dogs are they? They are, well, Bella is, uh, she's the older one. She's a full-blown chow. And mm -hmm. Charlie is a uh, half-breed. He's a half-chow and he's half-Akita. Okay, um, yeah. Because I know my dogs, son. You know? Yeah, my son has, has done this with his beagle. Yeah. And uh, there's no, because hounds tend to have terrible skin issues. Yeah. And um, it's just gone away. There are no skin issues for the dogs. So it's grains. We can't feed these animals grains. No, no. These grains are killing us. And they're, I, not, meant, they're not meant to eat them at all. I had almost, I don't say an argument, but it was a discussion with a vet with regard to this. And I had explained that the dogs used to itch, itch, itch. And then when I moved them off of the, uh, the food with the grain, Mm -hmm. and it was grain free all of the itching stopped also uh, as a side note if your if your dog is having problems with its coat aside yeah. from taking out the grains make sure you are giving your dog filtered water right. tap water will create right. hot spots mm -hmm. all kinds of problems with their coats we had this with bella we switched off the water my you know my daughter was giving her a tap i'm like no stop it so um yeah. we, we got the filtered water in place within yeah. A week, Kara. Her fur, her coat started to look so much more improved. And today, her coat looks beautiful, has the shine back to its sheen and so on. But anyway, going back to this uh, this vet, yeah. so I'm telling him, dog was itching, and, and uh, so we took him off the grains and all that. And uh, so he says to me, he goes, well, it's not proven that grains have the same effect on animals as it, it does on humans. So I looked at him and I said to him, I just told you, I said, that the dogs <laughs> used to itch, and when I took them off the grains, they stopped itching, okay? I'm not here to debate you. When I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know that the dogs had this problem, and then when I switched their diet and changed their diet around, that problem went away. I'm like, I just don't want to hear any field research. What are you talking about? You know, and then, <laughs> then he goes on to say that when the, uh, when the, the, the marketeers, the salespeople come in, to the vets, like they do, like the drug do um, companies come in and talk to doctors and give them samples and all that stuff. He starts talking about what they're telling them. I looked at him like, you are completely clueless. <laughs> You're lost. <laughs> Guess what? Yeah. I'm no longer coming to you anymore as a vet. You're mm -hmm. done because uh -huh. clueless, you know? Well, and that, that kind of leads me back um, to something that we should point out because uh, it's part and parcel of how we ended up with illegal, with something that is so miraculous being illegal and the Rockefellers and all that, bear in mind that the way they train doctors from the word go 
-hmm. the way they've set that up gang is to make to open spaces in their psyche so that they are mind controllable so that they you know there's a reason that they train them like they train them yeah. there's a reason it is beyond brutal there's a reason they don't get any sleep and they don't see the outside for three months at a stretch when they're interns it's so they're a fundamentally 100 percent malleable mm -hmm. This is a big reason why you, th you think you're talking to a robot. You think you're talking to a robot because you are talking to a robot. Yeah. These have been, these are, these are made entities. Not all of them, not all of them. Some of them wake up. There's a woman in Connecticut who's an integrative pediatrician. I'm just going to say her name is Nancy O'Hara. And yeah. she's been working to clean out kids with autism and all of that. Once she realized that she was seeing, she's a peed, and once she realized that she was seeing kids with live MMR in their guts, and somehow they always had autism and blah, blah, blah. I mean, so it's not all doctors. It's not all doctors, but no. you have to understand that they're being, this is an army of robots that's been sent, uh, sent out into the world quite on purpose by the Rockefellers, okay? Yeah, plus they've been trained in technology and uh medical approaches which are medical approaches and technology that they are allowed to know in other words yeah they're told this is the very best we have available today this is the very best medicine this is the very best technology and so on. right it's state-of-the-art only in the sense that relative to what we're allowed to be treated with medicinally right. and also with technology so the doc is actually you know they I personally believe most doctors are really good people. They want to help people, but like yeah, they just are, don't. They're born and bred into that system. They and don't realize what's been done to them. No, and if and if they don't wake up, what happens is you know they they are drinking the Kool Aid and they believe that there is no other way to treat something other than me writing on a piece of paper and handing you a prescription. Right, right. You know they don't, they don't want to. Most of them have no clue about holistic ways of of treatment. The no. integrative medicine doctors, like you mentioned, the lady up in Connecticut. Yeah, uh, we've got you know integrative medicine doctors, medical doctors here right, in North Carolina. They're all over the country. They're actually very good because they're thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? So right, um, but anyway. and they're targeted though. They're targeted. Well, they get targeted if if they get uh, if they venture too far off the reservation. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So exactly. If, exactly. If you start making a name for yourself. And you start espousing approaches which are cutting across the grain that contradict mainstream medicine, then you're you're going to have a problem. Right. To say, somebody told me too about dentists. They said the same thing with dentists yeah. that yeah. if a dentist ventures off the reservation, and if they start yeah. talking in terms of, uh, in other words, that's why most dentists will not will not talk contrary or or anything against fluoride. Right, right. They don't have a choice. They don't have, they a, don't choice have a choice. If they do, they could actually get their license yanked. Yep. And they do have the highest rate of suicide of any medical professional, by I the way. I know that. Is that right? They do. Yes. They are trapped. They are trapped in their, in, yeah. a, in a very specific way. Okay, you've got mercury, which yeah. is now, I mean, now acceptable to come, you know, people are having their amalgams taken out. Yeah. I had my last one taken out in like, I don't know, 2012 or something. So there's mercury and there's fluoride, which they know damn well. Yeah. They're not dumb. And this, that information is so mainstream now. But because they are so not allowed to talk about or, or deviate, they do have the highest rate of, su of suicide of any medical professional out there. Um, okay, so this is my view, Michael, is we have to play the... Um, we have to play the legalization game. We have to smile and say, you betcha. You just go right on ahead and legalize it. I think that's exactly the right thing to do. And then we're going to, we're going to have, we're going to slip in authenticity and health. And just remember out there, they want to keep you extraordinarily confused as to what's going on. I wasn't even sure which were the states where, where it was all legal and how many states were, you know, I know a few of them because Maine is one. Although I will tell you one of the, that was a very interesting situation because medical marijuana has been legal there for a long time. And it's a very, actually a very safe state 
to sort of practice um, yeah. treating people medically. Okay. Um, but recreational was just sort of passed in that state by like 51%. It wasn't a huge landslide or anything. Yeah. The people who are pro cannabis in Maine weren't really all that excited to see recreational pass because they know what's going to happen is now the big guys from Colorado, like, like this roundup, you know, is, and California are going to move in and make a, uh, an industry out of it. So yeah. you see it moves from being artisanal to being industrial strength bullshit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is, I thought that was really interesting that the people who were the most pro cannabis weren't, weren't really excited about what was getting ready to happen because they knew the other shoe was going to drop, you know? Yeah. I mean, and, and that's what's, at, that's what's going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these guys, they come in and uh, the vultures is what they yes. are. And, yes. you know, they're going to swoop in and they're going to, um, they're super opportunists. They're going to take a, advantage of any opportunity, any little crack in the door and try to commandeer. Yeah. And, and take yeah. over the narrative and uh, and profit from it exceedingly. So, this is what happens. This is the the world that we live in. You know, and yeah. that's why you're right, Kara. What we need to do is, you know, when things do kind of move forward a little bit, we you know we need to take advantage of it mm -hmm. and try mm -hmm. to push the envelope a little bit more, right, mm -hmm. to our mm -hmm. benefit. Right. But this is one of those things, Mike, remember seven, eight years ago when we first started talking and I said, my kids are sick. I said, I can count on one hand the number of times I went to the doctor when I was a kid. You couldn't, you couldn't stop us. You couldn't stop us. No. You break and a bottle kids, and you needed stitches. That's when you went to the doctor. That's when you went. Kids, and I said to Mike from the get-go, because this is what sucked me into chemtrails. This is what sucks me into everything. Because because our children are sick, but guess what? They're not just sick anymore. They're actually dying. These children are enduring lives of pain and suffering and emotional trauma beyond the scope of anything that we ever had to cope with, ever, ever, ever. And I, I'm, a, I'm gonna talk about anything that it's so easy to, 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 to apply a nutrient like this to the human population mm -hmm. and elevate our quality of life by like a billion, okay? This just ain't okay. And that's why I'm on, I'm, I'm gonna be, this is one of the things I'm gonna be talking about a lot because we need to know what the endocannabinoid system is. And people are still of the mindset when they see, oh look, there's an interview about cannabis they think they think we're talking about partying. Yeah, we gotta stop that, Mike. We gotta stop that attitude and that mindset and well, that brainwashing. Well, we have to keep talking about it because they're conditioned to to think that way. You know, yeah. I remember yeah. growing up as a kid. You know, thinking that weed was bad. Yeah, because of all of the uh, the indoctrination that went through your television sets and the, back in the time the newspapers and all that stuff. You know. Yeah. So yeah, so it's it's a matter of breaking the conditioning, and you know. Making them sick, Kara, I was thinking as you were saying all these things that making our kids unhealthy. The, the, one of the biggest things, too, is just ignorance. They yeah. have instilled uh, so much ignorance into people that, and I don't mean ignorant like stupid, although there are a lot of stupid people out there. I'm talking about ignorant from the standpoint of not knowing, just like, yeah, you don't know. Right. And so if you don't know something, you're, you know, chances are you're not going to go look. You're not going to try to explore and discover. And you're kind of in this uh, this limbo state, you know, suspended animation, if you will, because they've stolen their minds. Yes. You see? Absolutely. And that, yes. to me, is, a, is a, a monstrosity of a crime to, to steal somebody's mind and, and just, just commandeer it and make them think thoughts that you want them to think. You know, most yeah. people, I was yeah. talking to Freeman yesterday. I was on his show as a guest. And I, I said, you know, most people don't have an original thought. Oh, they right. Think they do. They think yeah. they do, but all they're doing is they're our thoughts are not our own. They're not yeah. right. They're just spewing back what they've heard, what they've learned, what they've been taught. You yeah. know, yeah. it's really sad. It's sad. Well, yeah. And I look around, and I because I have 
children who are young adults, that keeps me in touch with kind of that strata yeah. of our of our population. We have a situation where there's so there's a eugenics program that is so heavily going on so heavily right now. They want to drop us so much that this particular generation is carrying the weight of buildings around emotionally that there is no reason in God's green earth that they should be having to carry. They're all manufactured. They're false. They're inauthentic. They're, yeah. you know, it's all program and they are caving. They're crashing, which is the point. That's the plan. You know, it's either um, infertility or emotional crashing or, you know, this is the whole point is to crush us under a heel, right? Yeah. I'm sick and tired of watching kids die. I'm sick and tired of watching kids die. Okay. Yeah. And there are also a lot of people who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s that have been living with things like Lyme disease and fibromyalgia and things like that for their whole lives. And guess what? And, and MS yeah. and Parkinson's, those are all manufactured, gang. They're manufactured by the people who have us under their heel. Especially, right. you know, Lyme disease. That that's come yes. out now. That's mainstream now. That was yep. created by, you know, was by created. the US government, right? Off mm -hmm. of uh, off of Long yep. Island. And uh so yeah, that's not even, you know, one time that was like, you know, nut job, conspiracy, tinfoil hat stuff to mm -hmm. talk about. Now it's just mm -hmm. mainstream. Mm -hmm. now one it's of the most out, they did it. One of the most important things that's out there that we can do to help our children right now is champion the authentic, mm -hmm. genuine cannabis movement okay yeah. play ball with them you know do what they need you to do to make it legal because they're telling the whole wide world that it's that it works when they yeah, do that yeah. they went from it it. evil to hey has medicinal properties uh, mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. there are people that spent right. years in jail right for, and why are they still in jail in colorado can i ask you that question yeah that's that's something you know right he, he, and why the reason let them go, those guys out the reason is because um, I think is because when they do that, the the number of lawsuits that would be placed on the state. I'm at that. I'm, I'm just telling you that that's why they don't do it. That's why they don't mm -hmm. do it. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll keep you in here. Yeah, you could sue me, but how many people are going to are going to take that approach versus right. if I let everybody go, then there's going to yeah. be a class action, you know, lawsuit, yeah. or individual lawsuits yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think we should kid ourselves. They'd love to throw you in jail for a joint. Don't, oh, absolutely. don't kid yourself. Well, you were saying that, the that the laws between states that have legalized it are different. Yeah. So if you walk yeah. from one state to another state, even though both states say it's legal, you can you wind can up because be of Trump. legal irregularities between the states, you can still wind up in the clink. <laughs> yep. And you, be you better know that and you better believe that yeah. and you better understand that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's what I have right now, Mike. I think that's a lot. Yeah. I intend to continue to delve into this like I like it's my life's work. One, this is one of those things that uh, could be so good for so many people. Good for you, Kara. Um, and I will make sure Mike has. Well, Mike has all the graphics for sure. I have the graphics. I'll and put them in the I'll show. I'll make sure he has all the links so he can share them with you and share them with himself. And then maybe in you know a month or two, Mike and I can get back together. Yeah and uh really and go like another level down yeah. or two levels down because i'm i'm sure there are more levels right oh yeah there's going to be plenty of levels and uh <laughs> plenty of levels um no, before we head out because i think we have about 15 yeah. minutes I, I slotted out two hours for this and i'm sure like with uh, we're on zoom folks it's probably just going to go off like a light switch <laughs> after, uh, after yes time limit. recommend zoom by the way but just quickly um thoughts on where the alternative research community and the truth oh, well. are at. I'll talk about it for sure, because yeah. I think it's important to talk about the genesis of what's happened over the last couple of years. Two years ago, was it? Max Spears died. That yeah. started an avalanche of people reconsidering what they were doing, how they were doing it, who they were doing it with, and what the hell were we really about? You know, just get out of here and start talking. Okay, fair enough. But you know, when things like that happen, it really pulls you up short. Okay. When that happened, I reduced the amount of people that I talked to down to a handful. There were just a few people I trusted. Mm -hmm. And those are the only people I talked to for a long time. Mike was one of them. Randy Moggins was another. But there were just a couple of people. Now, in that two years, our community has continued to implode in some ways and that's i'm sure this is all good for it 
And also what's really interesting is it's kind of, it's like oil and water in a way, you know, the bullshit is kind of rising to the top and, and, and most of us can kind of see it, yeah. which is good. It's separating itself out. It's separating itself off a little bit so that it becomes much more obvious that it's bullshit and people are embarrassed when they fall for it. And, and that's fine. That's what happens to all of us. That's how we learn. We've all fallen for stuff and then been embarrassed. So what? Who cares? Who cares? Hey, you live and learn. Right? Yeah. Yeah, live and learn. But there's also stuff going on out there, like like there's a lot of bullying of some hosts going on when they speak up. Um, so we do get bullied. I've been bullied. I've talked about it on, on many shows. So let's talk about what's happening there. I think what's happening is enough people are getting fed up with being bullied or pushed around or used or that they're finally starting to stand up for, for themselves, name names, and say, this is what happened and this isn't okay. So what does that leave? It leaves people who are going to be there when the dust settles and we're just going to continue to do what we're doing. Mike and I both have had these, these, we've had these conversations. Hopefully this is okay to say, but you know, there, all of us, all of us hosts or people who are in the alternative community, hit spots where we just say, what the hell am I doing this for? Why am I doing this? I'm preaching to the choir. Nobody's listening to me. I'm being marginalized constantly. You know, it costs me money. It costs everybody money. We all have to have jobs just like everybody else, but we spend every extra cent and all our extra time getting this stuff out there. I like to go, um, I like to go out there once a year at least and see some eyeballs because I think it's really important to get in front of people. Yeah, but I underwrite those. Nobody, nobody pays me to, to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I go, I pay my own airfare. I hope to sell enough books to break even. And a lot of times I'll go out with a one-way ticket and hope for, the, hope for the best. Okay. A lot of us do that. You guys don't know that, I bet, but we do. Okay. Because, because we want so very much to say what it is that we're compelled to say, what we have to say is very, very important to us. Now, I think what a lot of us have done is reassess where we're putting our energy. Am I right, Mike? Where are we uh, putting have, our energy? Yep, I have. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So I, I'm interested in what Mike has to say about that for sure. But what I've, what I've come to understand is that, honest to God, there's two things. 75% or more of my energy has to be put into what I get, what, what goes out over the Internet, because that's the only way people will listen to you anymore. Okay. They will not get off their butts and go drive to see you where you are. They just will not. Second of all, I've realized that in, we are so conditioned to problem, reaction, solution now that I cannot get anybody to listen to anything I have to say unless I do it in that, deliver it in that way. I've got to give them 75% bad news so they'll listen to the 25% good news. Yeah. So what do you think, Mike? Well, you know, I have reevaluated, uh, you know, my approach too, and I have had thoughts about how much longer will I be doing this, yeah. because you do get to the point where you think to yourself, okay, well, what else is there to say that I haven't said in the last four years? That's number one. Yeah. And the other thing is, is that for a lot of people, what we do, they like to listen, but it's I call it conspiratainment. They they look at it as it's entertainment. <sighs> Yeah. Once it's over, they go back to doing whatever it is they were doing. Yeah. And I had this discussion again with Freeman yesterday. We talked about this because, you know, he, he has run into the same thing where people like your material if it's free. Okay. Yes. And, yes. and as soon as you turn around and say, hey, look, I've invested a tremendous amount of time and energy and money into this. Yeah. Um, so every once in a while, a little donation or contribution if you enjoy the work that would be appreciated greatly appreciated mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and the thing is don't get me wrong there are going to be you know the handful of people that will step up to the plate and do the right thing yeah. but the vast majority yeah. of people they just they walk away they mean they, they don't they don't do what it is that let's put it this way they don't put their money where their mouth is right okay? right and uh, and that's that's a little sad to see because uh, there is no money in this, folks. I don't make right. any money. Yeah. Out. You know, people have accused me. Uh, once <laughs> when I was telling Freeman that one of my guests came to me and said that they were told that uh, 
I was taking money. Like I was being paid by an alphabet agency you know, to do what I do. My response back to them yeah. was, you know, whoever told you that, tell them they have the wrong address. They've been sending the checks to somebody else because not one of those checks <laughs> has made its way into my mailbox. <laughs> and there's no money. Yes. In no, there's no money in this. No. I mean, there are a couple of people, by the way, who are getting those checks, and I know, but Mike's not one of them. No. Okay, no, Mike's not. not one of them, and I'm not either, by God. No, we're not. I mean, I'm not teaching anymore because of my, my activism. That was a healthy paycheck, and I used to spend quite a bit of my paycheck on my activism, right? Yeah. But people get so used to watching TV, you know, yeah. and the sponsors pay for the shows. They don't have to do anything but sit there and get right. fed, spoon-fed right. poison. They don't understand that this is actually this is actually much healthier. Yep. It's an energy exchange, right? A lot of us have set up uh, Patreons. I've set up a Patreon. Mike's got a Patreon. Okay. Uh, that's where I funnel. This is what I've said before. You got to still got to deal with YouTubes because you have to have a place to park your, park your stuff, right? It's still Although the largest venue you, to get your information out, right? It is. But you know what YouTube did to me? They uh, turned my channel into a paid channel, even though I did never ask them to do that. No. And that automatically booted thousands of subscribers. And they will not fix it. However, I have a place to park my videos for free and to upload and convert and that kind of stuff. So yeah. I keep that because that's where people are trained to go to see stuff. And then there's Facebook again. That's where everybody is. If you want to have a conversation, you have to, you have to do this, you know, and then the real hardcore people who support you really support what you're doing will end up on your Patreon. And they understand that the five bucks a month they give you really yeah. goes in your tank. It goes in your freaking tank or it buys macaroni and cheese. Okay. Seriously supporting your work because yeah. we aren't making any money on this. We aren't. And the people who tell me I should be giving this away for free, you know, I am hey, a writer. What do they do for a living? If they're a nurse, should they be doing that for free and well, go their, their paycheck? I mean, my response to that is all the people that are lying to you on a daily basis, they're not doing it for free. They're getting paid right. tremendous amounts of money to lie to you and to yeah. feed deception and propaganda. You don't yeah. question that. You don't sit there and say, well, these people are not sitting there saying, hey, how come he's getting paid $2 million a year to lie to me? You know, right. so, you know, to. Yeah, you don't they question don't, that. They yeah. don't, they never question that. So, but they do question if somebody's going out there and doing alternative research and trying to get some information out, oh, then we're going to question, you know, why it is, you know, you need a donation every once in a while or a contribution. It, right. It's like the whole thinking is all screwed up, you know. And what, right. I, what I've been looking to do, Kara, quite honestly, and uh, is to steer the, to steer the ship more toward, I want to get more into the metaphysical and more into the spiritual aspects of this because this is mm -hmm. what, in my view, folks, this is really what this is all about, Yeah. okay, at the end of the day. And for us to continue to kick the ball around the field, and pretend there's not a net, uh, and continue to talk about all the physical things that are going on that are bad. It's important right. to talk about that. Don't get me wrong. It's it's important to bring awareness to it. But yeah. there's a whole other half of that equation, right? The spiritual piece of it that very very few people talk about. Right. And I've dedicated. I've decided to dedicate a significant portion of my energy to my Fay research. Yeah. Right which is all about, like we've been talking about, I do workshops, Sovereign Imagination Studio workshops. I do most of them online. Some of them I can do in person. It's a completely different flavor when you can do them in person. Yeah. All right. But it's all about gaining control of your own thoughts because there really isn't a whole lot, a, a whole lot more important than that if you want to tap into your own power again. And it was the social engineering stuff that I've been bringing, bringing around for years now that led me back to this idea that we are actually descended from a race that uh, it was mighty and powerful and we still have all of that. We just, why do you think making us, uh, you know, amnesiatics is job one? Why do you think making us so we can't remember our phone numbers is job one? They don't want us to remember who we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've got, you've got, you know, cannabis, which is a beautiful plant that can treat your body and restore you. Because can you can you really gain control of your own thoughts if you are miserably phys miserable physically, twenty four seven? No, you're focused on pain and misery. Yes, yes, right. it's all you can think about. That's understandable. So I am trying to do 
uh, trying to put a whole lot more of my energy into the workshops, which is empowering people and solution based. The Fay lectures, I've just got Michael knows. I made, I, I've just made a DVD. I'm so proud of myself because I am known in these circles as a real techno can't, a techno can't do. <laughs> <laughs> she can't do it, man. She just can't do it. I either have to, depending on what the problem is, I, I either have to call Michael or Randy. It depends on what kind of a situation it is. And I know which one to call now, see? Yeah. But they I'm have, usually the audio build, guy. I could do Yeah, audio. yeah. I build them out. So they build me out. <laughs> they continue to bail me out. But yeah. it is quite, it's quite a joke in the alternative community. But I have managed to get a DVD. It's under review right now. Hopefully it'll be out in a couple of weeks. I have so to I'm thank Randy, by the that. way, for nice things he said about the album. I have to, I have to catch up with so many people. I feel bad now. Yeah, but. yeah. Randy's one of those guys. He's one of my go-to guys as well. Michael is yeah. one, and Randy, uh, because as I've said, the alternative community, a lot of us had to go back to back for a couple of years because we just didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah. yeah. Or what to do about it or where it was coming from or any of that stuff. So it was good to have people to go back to back with. I will tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's good to, and it's good, you know, and you do settle in with the people that you can trust. That's right. And they, you know, they, right. they become friends and confidants and, uh, and there are others that you may have, you know, interacted with in the past and, uh, you don't yes. anymore because, you know, yes. you found things out and, uh, or you just found out that maybe the chemistry is just not good. Right, but right. It may not be a bad person. It's just that the chemistry doesn't work. So, yeah, you, know, you find uh, it's what I call like finding your tribe. <laughs> yes, that's a good word to use. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it really is. Your tribe is out there to start speaking your truth, and your yeah. tribe will show up. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Mike. So I don't. That's where I'm at right now. All right, Karen. That was a great conversation, and uh, yeah. it was good to have you come back. We and always have. Good we'll talk maybe another two or three months or whatever. We'll do a follow up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll let you know what I'm finding. And you watch the stuff that I send you. And, um, you know, this is how human beings are. It is in conversation right. that we come up with stuff, that the epiphanies happen in the conversation, right. one person to another. So, right? Right. Okay, my friend. All right, Kara. So we'll talk soon. I'll see you on Facebook. Okay, my love. Bye. Right. Bye-bye. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless. Thank you.